today. Our patient is having four discs repaired in the lumbar spine. Good morning, Dr. Duke. I'm going to give you some numbing medicine, okay? If you have any pain, just tell me. But don't, don't try to move around. So I'm going to probably have to make two incisions. One will be at 5-1, 4-5, five, five, maybe 3-4. The other incision, it will be up at L2-3. So I'm going to infiltrate two areas. You're doing great. Everything's okay. Yeah, you're doing great. Everything's okay. Give him some ventilation to his face. That'll make him feel better. You have a fan or something you can do? or You can use the the and uh, Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 Blood pressure is good. Try to get it down a little bit. Shot. All right, 5-1 is going to be really challenging. Okay, so our patient has a degenerative disc disease. He's uh, over 80 years old. He doesn't want to live in pain anymore, so he came to us to have his disc fixed. Now, he has not only um, these degenerated discs. Can you show me? I guess that's probably okay. I'm going to be talking to my technician, Jordan. I think our orbit's off a little bit. I'm not seeing the foramen at 5.1. I'm not seeing the S1N plate. Now, this patient has pretty severe degenerative disc disease, okay? And, um, yeah, it's worse. Let's see what that does. The first thing I need to do is I need to set up the x-ray. I don't know. That... Uh, yeah. So for those of you watching, uh, for the first time, we use an x-ray machine in the operating room called the fluoroscope. And lay still, all right? Yeah. And it requires that we line up the machine with the spine on the lateral axis and the front back axis. So we want to it's not terrible, Jordan, but let me see what I can do, okay? We really want what's called a true lateral, and we want a true lateral at the level we're fixing. So to give you an idea of what that means, um, you want to be able to see through the side of the spine, true side, because the spine is three-dimensional. So if your angle of um, your trajectory of your x-rays through the body are not exactly lateral to the segment of the spine that we're working on, so in this case L5S1 right now, then you're going to have what's called a rotatory effect or rotation. And the image you get is not going to be an accurate representation of where you are on the patient. So what's wrong? Why can he not get comfortable? So sedate him. I mean, just g give him a little bit, enough to make him not really care about being claustrophobic. You know, give him some of that, uh, what is it you give him? The dissociative anesthetic. Ketamine. Ketamine. I need him. Yeah, I need him to be able to respond. So, and I'm going to be there soon. All right. You see those facet joints at L5? They're a little bit off by about a degree and a half. And that's maybe not a wag, but an orbital issue. And I think he's moved away from you. That's why. Let's see. Shot? So my job here in the operating room is not just to operate. Your, your orbit's off. It's worse. My job is not just to operate, but I have to actually um, play a kind of human herder. I got to herd and get get his body where I want it to be so that we can actually get an accurate representation. Let's try a little further, see what happens. Maybe we've gone past the, the midpoint. Go, go even further, let's see what happens. Shot. Believe it or not, that looks more lined up, right? The facets do. Now I think we're off on WAG. A little bit. Yeah, 
it's weird because if you look at his facets at L5 on S1, the inferior facet of L5, they're actually, to me, they're lined up better now, but if you look at the back of the L5 vertebral body, it's off. So our facets are just basically, one is bigger than the other. That's how you explain that because the back of the L5 vertebral body cannot remodel that much. So let's go ahead and get the back of the L5 see if we can get back the alignment we had before maybe a little better it's more of an orbital issue than a wag issue <laughs> do you want to put a nasal trumpet in are you okay one more shot all right that's i don't know that's worse All right, so why are we struggling with the x-ray? The reason why is that um, the normal anatomy is gone. He has such severe arthritis from his discs and facet joints that it's distorted the normal anatomy. And we need normal anatomy like the neuroforamen, the end plate, this, this um, facet joint. We need to see that to be able to navigate correctly. So for example, if you're navigating around some islands on a boat, and you do it all the time, and you know where the islands are, and you wanna go to the left of the first island, to the right of the second island. Well, if you have fog, you can't see the islands, and you don't have any special equipment like radar, then your landmarks for navigating that are reliable landmarks that don't move, which are the islands, they, they're gone. They're no longer there for you to use. And so navigating becomes much harder to do. Uh, impossible, as a matter of fact. So I have to use navigational landmarks here in his spine that um, I can rely on to get me to where I need to be. Shot? Which is the L5-S1 disc. All right. So I think we're still off on orbit. Shot? Hmm. See if you can get me a foramen at 5-1. I think that's worse, right? Go the other way. Shot. Shot. Uh, I don't know. Is that worse, Luis? I think uh, try a little bit more. Yeah, your, your side higher. You're, let's just put it this way. You're way off on orbit. You're either way off one way or way off the other way, and I just don't know which one it is. Keep going. Go, go, go. Yeah, yeah. Shot. That's actually, that's actually, I'm starting to see a foramen, right, at 5-1? Yeah. So that, that yeah, you may have been right the first time when you had him rotated. Shot. Shot. Don't move. Don't move, shot. It's just we're too blurry. I think we've gone, what do you think, we've gone past it or what? Yeah. Shot. Well, now I have to draw on my experience to try to navigate to where we need to be because the fluoro is though it has some reliable features some of it's not yeah we're off still shot yeah. huh Give me an AP. Just lay still. The more he moves, the harder it is and the longer it's going to take us. So um, if you can get him comfortable to where he's not moving. Yep. But um, we have to find it or, you know. You can actually see his prior laminectomy there. All right. Let's go back to a lateral. Yeah, we're we're
camera's really far off there. You got to improve the quality of that picture. It's way overexposed. You're way off on the lateral, I think. Try to drop your side. I mean, go back to dropping your side. We're just, we're just off. Drop it more. We're off. I don't know if it's his moving. Drop it a little more. All right. That's probably right there going to be the best we're going to get. Shot. 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 You awake? AP? Good. So, folks, for watching, I, I have to uh, tell you that a lot of our patients come to us with back pain for 10, 20, 30 years. And when they have back pain that long, the reason for their back pain lateral is inflammation. And when you let the inflammation go for that long, the inflammation is a fire in your body. It's literally akin to a fire. Fire is destructive, period. Fire is destructive. And inflammation is destructive. It destroys joints. So when you have back pain and you just let it go, you're basically destroying your discs over time. And so that's what's happened here. The disc has become destroyed. Lay still. Where are you having pain? Huh? Where do you have pain? Carmen, where's your pain? AP. I think it's both places. I think, yeah, I think it's like right there. I need, I need reliable information. Just, this is going to be the hardest disc for us to get to and fix, the one that's going to be the most difficult. I mean, we're like perfect on AP and lateral. All right, I'm going to go for L45. I'm going to wait. Yeah. I'm going to give him a few more minutes. I'm going to come back to this one. I'm going to start L45. Um, let me just give him a little more numbing medicine. Understood. All right. So I'm pretty happy at this point with L5S1. And, you know, when you watch this video and see what we're doing, don't be discouraged. This is a 10 out of 10 in terms of difficulty. Um, and the truth is, is that, you know, I feel comfortable with what we're doing. But um, if you're just starting out doing endoscopic surgery, you won't be comfortable with a case like this. So you're going to have to start on much easier cases. We're going to go for L45. And what makes this case so difficult is, is not our equipment. Our equipment is the same equipment we use for everybody. And it's not my technique. My technique is the same. It's really the, the spine. Each patient's spine is different. And this patient's spine is a very difficult spine to do because of the amount of severe arthritis he has. It is just severe. And that doesn't stop me from trying to help people. If I, if I got scared of the severe arthritis patients, I wouldn't do them. I would just, uh, I would not do half my patients. And the reality is, is that when all is said and done and we're finished fixing this patient's spine here this week, that he's going to be, I think, very happy with the results. You okay? All right. Well, this is one of your bad discs, that's for sure. AP. So there's the L45. See how much easier 45 was? The reason it's easier is because 51 is at an angle down, and you have to angle down because the iliac crest bone blocks you if you don't angle down. So it's not a straight shot into 51, it's an angle down. Plus 51 has always, that's good, lateral. 
You can see the laminectomy. Hold on. Show them the laminectomy defect. Flynn, are you on the x-ray? This patient, yes, not only does he have scoliosis, the degenerative disc, outline that laminectomy defect. He's had a laminectomy. It's actually the Casper ghost. It's the whole ghost. So go up the edges of the laminectomy. You can see it. Yep, up, 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 up. Keep going up, up, and now around and down. It actually uh, looks like a kind of a penis stuck in the middle of his spine. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, maybe not a penis, a dildo. But look, either way, <laughs> it's a phallus. So um, I didn't do the laminectomy. I don't do laminectomies because they're so destructive. But you can see he's got that laminectomy defect done by some other surgeon. And of course, it didn't work. That's why he's here. Laminectomies don't work unless you only have leg symptoms like neurogenic claudication. That's when a laminectomy will work. But pretty much everybody has back pain, too. And laminectomies don't fix back pain. Lay still. You're doing great. Sean, is that it right there? All right. That's why you got to watch, because you never know what Dr. Duke Majin will say. That wild and crazy guy. All right. I have fans all over the world. I'm sorry I'm not uh, always politically correct, but um, I try to, to teach you guys. And, you know, you'll never forget that laminectomy defect, will you? Right? I mean, I could tell you what I really think, but if I do, some of you wouldn't understand. There's a reason I see a phallus in a laminectomy defect. Why is that? Because if you get a laminectomy, you're fucked. That's why I see a phallus <laughs> there, okay? So it's, it's Freudian, right? <laughs> Luis is like, it's going to be one of those days. <laughs> Just lay still. It's already hard enough. Please don't make it harder for me. Sean? All right. I'm just giving the patient a, a hard time. That's what every good surgeon does. Don't you know doctors always blame their shortcomings on their patients? Right, Luis? If we fail, we blame it on our patients, right? If you have back pain that doesn't get better with our treatment, we're going to blame you. I mean, I'm joking, of course. I hope those of you who know me well enough know that I'm being facetious. The reality is, is that, um, you know, he's moving in response because he has basically uh, had chronic pain. So this is a very sensitive area. That's why we're here. Did you take a picture? Give me an AP. So we're almost at L3-4, and then I'm going to do the L2-3. I can tell you right now, there's no way I can do the L2-3 through this incision. And by the way, if you look carefully at those x-rays, you can actually see the herniations. I'll show them to you in just a moment because it's kind of cool. You normally can't, that's perfect. You normally can't see herniations on an x-ray um, unless they're really big and somewhat calcified. So that indicates that these are big and calcified herniations, which they are. Now this patient's unique. He actually has herniations on both sides at four discs. All right, perfect. Show them the herniation at this level. You can see it right in front of the needle tip. There it is, right there. You guys see that with the white arrow? That is the herniation at L3-4. It's huge. And show them the herniation at L2-3, the next level up. There you go. So we usually, thank you, Jordan, we usually say you can't see herniations on x-ray because it's true, but when you, is he okay? Yeah. But when you have a calcified herniation, you can. And that's what this, this patient has. A calcified, he has calcified herniations, which we're going to fix with the laser shot. Yep. Great. We're almost there. Yeah, these are sensitive areas. This is where all this pain's been coming from. So um, we're going to fix that today. I'm really excited for him. Now, those of you may not know this, but this patient, because I told you he has herniations on both sides, okay? And his legs are symptomatic on both sides. So we actually have to treat both sides. Any questions from our audience? By the way, Flynn, if you get a question, always feel free to ask me the question. You don't have to wait for me to ask you. Yes, we do have a question from Sir, uh, Sir on Facebook. 
Great. And uh, does the laser uh, cause the disc to collapse even further, or uh, does it retain the disc? That's a great question. Thank you for asking. The laser does not remove the disc. The laser removes the herniation. The herniation is not part of the disc. It's the part of the disc that's squeezed out, basically. So um, laser does not cause the disc to collapse more. Actually, it prevents the disc from collapsing more because it's the arthritis, it's the inflammation in the back of the disc that's the cause of the disc um, collapsing. So what I'm doing with the laser is I'm getting rid of the cause or source of arthritis. We're almost done. Shot. So I'm actually touching the facet joint. I need to be a little bit higher. Shot. Yep. So far, everything's going well for him, but he's got severe arthritis here and his facet joints are massive. Shot. Shot. So this is the L23 uh, needle. Shot. And because I'm hitting the facet joint, I am moving a little bit more lateral, shot, yeah. each time, so that I can get a better approach to the disc, shot. Now the nice thing about this procedure that you may or may not know is that the Duke laser disc repair enters the spine right where the damage is. So we're not creating any new damage. We're actually going through a damaged area that we're there to fix. All right, so I'm very close but um, I need a little bit to get a little more anterior. Shot. Shot. Yeah, so that's better. Just about there. Shot. I can feel it, it wants to go. So, shot. See, now we're touching the herniation. Can you show them? how we're touching that herniation and then we'll, we'll be done. We need them awake. Yeah, we'll show them. Yeah, see the needle tip touching the herniation. All right, great. Great question, by the way, and I encourage you folks to ask questions. Sean? So feel free to ask me questions during the surgery, Sean. That's what I'm broadcasting live for is so that you can ask questions. Otherwise, we just record and you know post the video. We're recording, and sorry, we're recording and broadcasting live on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and um, LinkedIn. All right. When I saw this patient in clinic, just so you all understand, his his butt crack is right here. Why is that important? It kind of gives you a reference point. The belt is literally worn right about here. Okay, there's the belt, okay? So the first disc we're gonna repair is the lowest disc in his spine. It's right here, L5, S1. Above it is L4, 5. And then L3, 4. And finally L2, 3. All right, just lay still. How's he doing? Is he awake? Yes. All right. Yes. I need him awake and comfortable. So just let me know when he's ready. At this point, um, remember, this patient came to me with an MRI showing herniated, degenerated discs with annular tears at L23, L34, L45, L5, S1. You can see the MRI. And um, he's got a lot of back pain. Lay still. And when I asked him, where is your back pain? He said, it's right in here. Now, if he had just pointed down here, I would just be fixing L45, L5S1. But because his back pain starts here and goes all the way to here, we know that he's probably got pain from L23 as well and L34. So I have to treat all of them. Are you comfortable? Lay still. He said okay. He said okay. 
All right, so actually 5-1, we need to advance a little further. Where is your pain? All right. Yeah, just lay still. Stop trying to get up. I don't know how I got that one. Shot. Let's get an AP. You're doing great. Lay still. We're going to put you to sleep in a minute. Yeah, what we have is a sundowner, okay? Yep. And, you know, a little bit of disorientation and they get agitated. So basically, what we're talking about is the patient, uh, you know, he's over 80 years old, and when we get that old, our brains aren't the same as when we're 20, okay? And there's a loss of neurons and um, frontal lobe neurons, and basically, um, the frontal lobe of the brain really settles patients and when you lose part of the frontal lobe, you become more agitated, easier to agitate. So a little bit of anesthesia, and it's wearing off, and now he's kind of like a little disoriented and little, acting a little agitated, but that's what we expect. Just lay still. Lay still, buddy. So the mistake then is to make them more sleepy, and then they just keep going through the cycle of agitation and sleep, agitation and sleep. Yeah, we need you awake, okay? We're gonna put you to sleep in a minute, but I need your participation right now. All right, just lay still. So he's awake now, which is where we need him. Our anesthesiologist and nurse have done a great job. And now I'm gonna just do our discogram and verify that um, these discs are a source of his pain and also to stain the degenerated nucleus blue. Are you comfy? All right, good. Lay still. Don't move. How bad is that on a scale of 1 to 10? What number? 0 to 10. What's the highest it went? 9. All right. Is that where you get your back pain? Yes. All right. So that's a 9 over 10 at L5S1. So that is L5S1 is definitely a cause of his daily pain. Is it better now? So you see I suck some of it out. Yeah, just say yes or no. We're going to put you to sleep soon, okay? You're doing great. All right, so our patient traveled here from... What? Yes, I know. You're doing great, okay? We're going to put you to sleep soon. How bad is that on a scale of 1 to 10? How bad did it get? How bad did it get? How bad did it get? Ten. That's what I thought he said. Is that where you get back pain? Yes or no? Is that where you get back pain? Yes. Yeah, so it's concordant. All right. We're almost done, I promise. Lay still. We're almost done. We're going to put you to sleep, okay? I just need your help here. All right. What's your, you gotta stay still, okay? How bad is that? How bad is it? What number is it? What number was that right now? We just did a test of you. Zero to ten. What number? Ten. Ten. All right. All right, you're doing great. We're almost done. So um, his tears are so big that the dye is just all leaking out. I'm not even, even able to pressurize the disc at all. So let's see what happens here. Uh, How bad is that on a scale of 1 to 10? How bad? Is that where you get your pain? Is that where your back 
Is that where you get your back pain? Yeah. All right. All right. Well, I suck some of the dye out. Shot. Let's see what we got. All right. Good. All right. Let's get an AP and then we'll go back to a lateral. All right. Great. So for those of you watching, um, we just tested all four discs that we plan to treat today. So just to recap, people with chronic back pain, there's different causes of that pain. And the most common cause by far is a annular tear, a tear in the back of the disc called the posterior annular tear. Oh, you can see the dye going down the nerve root on, the, on that side. Show them the dye going down the nerve root. That's so cool. It's, it's on the outside of the nerve root, and that would be the L4 nerve root on the left. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, why, why four or five? Yeah, yeah go ahead. Okay. So this dye is leaking out of the disc, which I injected on my side, okay. and it, well, you can put him to sleep. Yeah, you can go to sleep now. We're going to put you to sleep. Count from one to 100 out loud. So the dye actually leaked out through a tear in the back of the disc called an annular tear on the patient's right side and went down his right L4 nerve root. Count from one to 100 out loud. All right, so people come in with back pain, and the most common cause is an annular tear that's inflamed. It must be in the back of the disc, and usually associated with the disc bulge or herniation, almost every time, every time it is. The problem is, is that the MRI will miss it sometimes because they're small bulges, or the radiologist just doesn't read it. They miss it. So I can tell you that's why we do the MRI review at Duke Spine Institute. And the MRI review is done because we can see the source of the pain that radiologists miss and other doctors miss. That's why if you have somebody with back pain or neck pain, get an MRI review done, it's free. And I'll tell you why you have pain. So the most common cause of back pain and neck pain is a herniated disc. This patient had four, and most importantly on exam in the clinic, he said his pain went from here to here. This whole area was hurting him. If it was just one disc, he would point to that one disc because the pain from these discs is highly localized due to somatic afferent innervation that goes to the somatotopic parts of the sensory cortex. All right, we'll start with L45. I can't talk too much, but I gotta start working. Um, would you please show them, Flynn, the video on why people get back pain from a herniated disc, shot? Meanwhile, I'm gonna keep working and we're gonna get this first disc fixed. Traumatic injury to the disc can cause annular tears to form. Pressure on the disc causes herniation of the nucleus pulpus through the annular tear. Inflammatory tissues develop within the annular tear causing back pain. The inflamed annular tear generates pain signals. Additional injuries can cause symptoms to worsen. Inflammation from the annular tear can spread to nearby nerve roots causing leg pain. Signals travel up nerves to the brain, causing localized back pain. Pain signals reach the primary somatosensory cortex, causing conscious awareness of pain. If you have a herniated or bulging disc and back pain, submit your MRI for a free review at www.mri.dukespine.com. Yeah. So we were just talking uh, on this patient and just worth talking about, everyone thinks anesthesia is the same, but it's not. For every patient, it's different. And some patients doing the anesthesia is more challenging. For this patient, this patient is a, is a challenge anesthetically. And a lot of it has to do with how sensitive the patient is to the drugs we're giving. All right, I need to see the scope view. So let's take a look at what we're seeing here, folks. This is beautiful. We are inside 
the tear at L45 on the left side. And what I'm seeing, Grabber, is the annular tear right there at 12 o'clock. Let's turn the uh, lighting down one click on brightness, one click. I want you all to see this tear right here. Yeah, there it is, thank you. You can see the blue material stuck in the tear. That's the herniation. So there's a tear with a herniation stuck in it. That's what we're here to debride. And that's what separates the Duke laser disc repair from all other spine surgeries in the thank world. You. There is no other spine surgery that offers an annular debridement, cleaning out the annular tear to get rid of the pain by getting rid of the inflammation. All right, any more questions, Flynn? Yes, we just got a, another question from Sear on Facebook. Uh, do things on the x-ray and the MRI look different? And do you fix things if they are found on the x-ray but not on the MRI? Okay, hi, Sierra. Thanks for asking. Does the x-ray and the MRI look different? The answer is yes. The MRI gives you far more information than an x-ray. X-rays are really good at looking at um, the bones and the structure of the bones, whether or not they're normal. But MRI is really good at looking at the discs and other soft tissues. So if you want to diagnose the source of back pain, an MRI is the most important test there is. As a matter of fact, that's why most insurance companies refuse to pay for MRIs because they don't want doctors to find out why people have pain because then we're going to want to fix it. Now, if I find something on the x-ray, could we fix it without an MRI? The answer is no. Um, there's nothing that could be found on the x-ray that I would fix without getting an MRI first or CAT scan. And the reason is simple. The only thing you really see on the x-ray is um, some structural abnormalities, but you need to know why they have that. So you need the MRI. Now look here, this is fascinating. Look at that pink stuff right there. You guys see that pink stuff? That is the inflammatory tissue inside the annulus fibrosis. That's the source of this patient's back pain. That's what I'm here to get rid of, along with the herniations. Now this right here is a herniation. So let's show these uh, viewers the animation video Duke Spine Institute created to explain what the Duke Laser Disc Repair actually does when we clean up the annular tear with the laser. Disc herniations are a common cause of chronic back pain. The inflamed annular tear causes back pain. Inflammation of the nerve roots causes leg pain. A Band-Aid sized skin incision is made. A small tube is inserted without damaging the bone or soft tissues. The laser removes the herniation and debrides the annular tear. The annular tear heals on its own. If you have a herniated or bulging disc and back pain, submit your MRI for a free review at www.mri.dukespine.com. Yeah, welcome, I know, welcome back uh, to the operating room. It's again, uh, April 5th, 2022. I'm Dr. Duke Majin, CEO and founder of the Duke Spine Institute. And I'm here with my A-team. I've got, uh, I've got, who do we have today? We've got uh, Luis, who's filling in for Mr. T. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> The, t the strong one, the one with all the muscles. And we've got uh, Dr. Berndez, who is uh, face, all right? And I'll be Hannibal. I'm sorry, guys. There's other, good, there's other characters, but I don't know them all. Uh, you can be Daisy Duke, even though she's really not part of the A-team. 
It's so funny. I was watching uh, TV the other day, and the Dukes of Hazard were on. I think I was at the airport in Europe. They still play reruns in Italy of the Dukes of Hazard. They love that show. Yeah, I haven't seen it in forever either. You know, Boss Hogg and Roscoe. And those were great shows back in the day. Like, they were full of action. Now, if you compare them to shows today, they don't seem so full of action. All right, what are we looking at here, folks? We are inside the annular tear on the left side of this patient's L4-5 disc. And you can see that uh, what's bleeding there is the end plate, basically a bone spur that I had to remove. And this is really the end of the annular tear right here. So we're gonna clean this up. There's some more inflammatory tissue, the pink stuff. You always know inflammatory tissue because it's pink. It's pink because of all the blood vessels that are in it. Inflammation requires a blood supply and that blood supply comes in the form of capillaries which uh, carry blood throughout your body uh, into the tissues. And the larger vessels are your arteries and veins. Arteries and veins basically carry the blood to the tissues but the perfusion of the tissues requires capillaries. Capillaries are a special type of blood vessel that has a very thin wall. They have a huge surface area and they basically slow down the flow of blood to allow the exchange of nutrients and oxygen and carbon dioxide. So without getting too technical, um, the back of the disc and the tear in the annulus does have a blood supply, but the center of the disc does not. And so that's where there's a lot of confusion. People don't understand. They think, oh, how could the disc be inflamed if there's no blood supply? The, the no blood supply is a generalization, okay? And generalizations, unfortunately, are not good when it comes to understanding the pathophysiology of degenerative disc disease with respect to creating back pain and leg pain. You really have to think beyond the simplicity of what you're taught in medical school. You have to really understand how disease actually changes the anatomy of the disc, because it does. And that's something all my colleagues have failed to understand in neurosurgery. They don't understand that a diseased disc actually does have a blood supply as opposed to a normal disc, which doesn't. And the reason is from inflammation. Inflammation creates a blood supply into the disc, just like a tumor can create a blood supply because it releases uh, um, basically what are called cytokines, which are chemicals. <clears throat> And those chemicals and proteins, little peptides, they basically promote the ingrowth of blood vessels. So tumors and inflammation have the ability to create what's called neovascularization or new blood vessels. Um, another thing that does in the human body is a process called ischemia. Ischemia is where tissues don't get enough oxygen. And so they, they send out a distress signal in the form of a chemical mediator that causes more blood vessels to grow to where the ischemic tissue is, so creating more blood supply. So tumors, inflammatory tissue, and ischemia are all capable of creating more blood flow into a tissue that doesn't have enough. And that's exactly how the disc gets its blood supply. And that's why there's inflammation and that's why there's pain from the inflammation. Fascinating, isn't it? And nobody teaches me this in medical school or residency. I had to figure it all out. Of course, the basis of ischemia and, and, and growth of blood vessels I learned in medical school, anatomy, histology, pathology, but the uh, application of this understanding to the disc and how it causes back and neck pain is something I had to do myself. Once I started fixing these discs with the laser, I started asking myself, why is the back pain going away? Because, you know, back pain's not supposed to go away with surgery, so why is it going away? And that's when I figured out it's because we're debriding the annular tear and getting rid of the source of inflammation. So it's basically uh, something that I learned on the job, so to speak, and I've been trying to teach people about it for years. Unfortunately, 
the dogma in neurosurgery of, you know, back pain has no known cause. We don't know why people get back pain, which is pretty uh, ironic when you consider that neurosurgeons accept the fact that discitis, which is inflammation of a disc, can be extremely painful. And that um, a fracture of a bone in the spine can be very painful. So why couldn't we not accept the fact that a disc that's inflamed and degenerated is painful? So it's beyond me why my colleagues have not thought outside the box to understand that discs are the cause of back pain. So in the meantime, I'm here fixing people's back pain by fixing their annular tear. So we want to spread the word so people don't continue to suffer needlessly. Hey, lay still. What is it, Berndes? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Yeah. All right, we're pretty much done with this disc. So what we're looking at here is uh, the tear, and I've debrided it. And now, oh, let me have the grabber again. We're going to be able to see better if I put the grabber in there. Um, all right, so somehow the grabber always stops, you know, stops a little bit of bleeding. Let's look for the nerve root. And there it is up there in that fat. And this is the back of the disc that's actually where the tear was and the herniation was, and it's gone. So there's just a little bit of uh, arthritic stuff here. But we've gotten rid of the, the source of his back pain at this point. So I'm pretty happy with that. Let me just see, Luis, if I can fish out any more free fragments that are loose. I don't want them coming out tomorrow or the next day. So we know we're going to be fixing the other side of his spine. This patient is having both sides done. Um, scope off. He's actually having a, a, a second procedure on Thursday, so in two days. He wants his right side fixed as well. So we're doing the left today and the right tomorrow. And like I said, he's over 80. I can't tell you his exact age. I know it, but I don't want to share it because it's a, you know, protected information. But um, in essence, being over 80 doesn't mean you can't get your back fixed, all right? Now, if he was having a fusion surgery, maybe we don't want to do a fusion on an 80-year-old. I've done it before. They do fine, as long as they're medically fit. Um, I'm sure you'd rather do a fusion because then you can innovate them and just read your books. <laughs> but the reality is, is I could fix his back with either fusion or with the laser surgery. And why go through a major fusion surgery if you don't need to, okay? So he chose the laser surgery and that's what we're doing. That's L45, we're done with. Luis, what are we doing next? We're in at 5-1. What are you afraid of? Uh, my tooth. Ah, I see what you're afraid of. Let's go lateral. So today is, uh, you know, my, my assistant, Luis, gets to pick the, the order that we're fixing these discs. All right, so we've shown you two video animations. One shows you why do herniated discs cause back pain, um, and that applies for degenerated discs as well. The second video is, what does the laser do to fix them? And that's what we, uh, yeah, that's what we uh, showed last. Why don't we run another video comparing the laser surgery we're doing today versus the alternative surgery for this patient, which would have been a four level fusion. And when I say four level, I mean four discs. That would have been the other surgery that would have worked for him, okay? But he didn't want that, he wanted the laser. All right, shot. Let's run that comparison video, Flynn. Sean? Duke Laser Disc Repair, a comparison with traditional spinal fusion surgery. A patient with chronic back or neck pain originating from a symptomatic disc injury could undergo either traditional spinal fusion 
or less invasive Duke laser disc repair. This MRI represents a typical case with L45 and L5S1 symptomatic discs. A symptomatic disc causing neck or back pain can include bulging discs, herniated discs, ruptured discs, degenerative discs, protruding discs, spinal stenosis, radiculopathy, and sciatica. This patient can choose traditional fusion surgery or the Duke laser disc repair to help alleviate the pain caused by and within the symptomatic discs. Here, two patients with comparable disc injuries are treated. On the left, the highly invasive spinal fusion, and on the right, the least invasive Duke laser disc repair. The spinal fusion requires a very large incision, usually leaving a large scar. The Duke laser disc repair requires only a very small incision, usually less than a half an inch long. In this small opening, a cylindrical rod, called a dilator, is inserted to gently spread the muscle to create a small passage and guide through which the surgery is performed endoscopically. The incision for the fusion continues, including penetrating the skin, fat tissue, and multiple layers of muscle through to the bone. With the Duke laser disc repair, a mallet is used to advance the tip of the dilator into the symptomatic disc. A tube, called the tubular retractor, slides over the dilator and is carefully positioned into the disc, again using the mallet. The rest of the entire Duke laser disc repair surgery will occur inside this narrow tube. To access the spine, the spinal fusion requires the muscle to be separated from the vertebrae. This very invasive action causes trauma and permanent damage to the muscles. Whereas in the endoscopic Duke laser disc repair, the muscle is not damaged. The endoscope camera is inserted into the tubular retractor to allow the surgeon to guide the laser inside each symptomatic disc. To accommodate the fusion hardware, a large bone grabber is used to perform a laminectomy by removing bone from the spine. The fiber optic laser used in the Duke laser disc repair is manipulated with great accuracy to remove only painful inflammatory tissue from the disc. In this highly magnified view, the laser is used to precisely remove damaged disc material that is causing the pain. The laser is debreeding, or essentially vaporizing, damaged tissue in the disc's outer layer, or annulus, specifically at the annular tear, the source of the rupture or herniation and pain. After the fusion patient's damaged discs are removed, a metal or plastic cage housing bone grafting material is inserted in place of the removed discs. Once the laser has removed the painful part of the annular tear, the endoscope and tubular retractor are removed, leaving less than one half inch incision in the skin, which is closed with a single stitch, steristrips, and a band-aid. Total time for the Duke laser disc repair surgery, approximately one hour. The fusion, however, is still underway. Holes in the spine must be tapped in preparation for the large pedicle screws that anchor the fusion hardware. The Duke laser disc repair patient is in recovery usually 45 to 60 minutes before release to go home. The fusion screws are inserted into the bone, as shown in the x-ray. After all screws are in place, rods are used to connect the screws together to prevent movement of the secured vertebrae. Cross links are added to bridge the rods together for additional stability. Fusion hardware, by design, is to fuse joints that normally move, preventing natural movement in the damaged portion of the spine. Whereas with the Duke laser disc repair, there is no loss of movement. Normal movement and flexibility of the disc and joints is preserved. The Duke laser disc repair patient is soon back home, enjoying life, with a very fast recovery, allowing normal activities without pain. Meanwhile, bone graft material is placed throughout the fusion surgery site. These morselized pieces of bone will eventually grow together to help promote the fusion process. Prior to closing the wound, a temporary drain is installed to allow excess fluid to drain. Average surgery time of a traditional two-level fusion is two and a half hours, with an additional three to four hours in the recovery room. As we've seen, in comparison, a spinal fusion requires a much larger incision and results in a significant amount of scar tissue. The Duke laser disc repair's half-inch incision leaves no scar tissue around the spine or nerves. A large amount of bone is removed with a spinal fusion. With the Duke laser disc repair, no bone is removed. Each disc is accessed through a natural opening in the spine. The entire disc is completely removed in a spinal fusion, even though only 5% may be damaged. The Duke laser disc repair leaves the normal parts of the disc in place, 
and removes only the painful annular tear on the damaged disc. Fusion requires hardware, including screws, rods, plates, etc. The Duke Laser Disc Repair does not require any hardware. The patient is totally hardware free. Fusion surgery is very invasive. Cutting and moving the muscle structures and tissues for a spinal fusion causes trauma resulting in permanent damage to the muscles. Whereas with the Duke Laser Disc Repair, there is no damage to the muscles. The Duke Laser Disc Repair is the least invasive surgery available to repair a damaged disc. With but I had to bring you this massive, look at this. Can you see this? Flynn? Yes, we can see it. All right, that is a big herniation. By the way, it was literally twice that big, but I, I couldn't get it all out, so I pulled off pieces for the last five minutes. So there's a giant herniation right there. We just got out. All right, can you see that? Pretty cool, huh? All right, scope back on. All right, there it is, we're clear. So that was a big herniation that was sitting in the foramen that I shoved back into the disc, and now I'm cleaning out the uh, rest of the tear. So I got a little bit of tear to debride here. How are we doing over there, guys? Good. I don't mind him being a little lighter to be safer. Whatever you need to do. I don't mind a little bit of moving. <clears throat> so some of our viewers don't understand movement. They think that when the patient moves that they're um, experiencing conscious pain, but they're not. There's two types of pain. There's conscious and unconscious. And unconscious pain is, of course, you know, as I'm doing this surgery, there's really pain, but the patient's not feeling any pain because they're sleeping, right? That's what anesthesia does, is it makes you unaware of the pain. And, but that doesn't mean that your, your brain doesn't pick up on pain signals. Pain signals are still sent there. So what's happening, though, is that we're putting the part of the brain asleep that interprets those signals consciously okay and what that means is the signals are still going to your parts of your brain that don't make it to your consciousness what does consciousness mean it means awareness so people are aware of pain when they're when they're conscious of pain they're aware of pain but there's also a lot of pain that goes to sub subcortical levels of the brain or unconscious areas of the brain like the brain stem the uh, red nucleus the medulla, the limbic system. And those pain signals are not, um, you're not consciously aware of them, but they can have effects on your blood pressure, on your, um, your mood, uh, and your heart rate. Uh, man, this, this uh, L34 was a really, uh, quite a big herniation, as a matter of fact, a couple of herniations. Okay, you guys doing all right? There's the tear, okay, that I wanted to breed. And I apologize for the poor visibility. It's due to just a little bit of oozing of blood, just on a microscopic scale, basically, but it's enough to cloud the view. Almost done with this disc. There's another piece of herniation right there. All right, so, so far we've had a few good questions. Do we have any more questions for Dr. Duke Major and myself? No new questions yet, Dr. Duke. I did not understand that. That was some garbaloosh. Did you say something, Flynn? Yes, we just got a new question. Um, Seer from Facebook is asking um, if Dr. Duke sees something that needs to be fixed while looking at the x-ray uh, that he doesn't see on the MRI, does it get fixed? 
Uh, no, I don't think that's an accurate statement. I don't think there is something that's seen on the x-ray that couldn't be confirmed on the MRI. Um, if you had a fracture, for example, it, the MRI scan is not just about confirming or not confirming what's on the x-ray. It's about also looking for causes. So I'll give you an example. Let's say you have a small fracture that's seen on your x-ray. You may not see that fracture on the MRI, but what we're looking for on the MRI is a couple of things. Number one, oh yeah, we got it. Number one, um, another cause for your symptoms that is not picked up on x-ray. And number two, we want to make sure you don't have, for example, like a tumor growing in your spine that would not be seen on x-ray, by the way. It would only be seen on MRI. Just about done. So if you've got a tumor that causes your fracture, well, you need to know that, that there's a tumor there and you won't see it on the x-ray. That's why you need an MRI. Uh, laser on, laser on. Now, maybe if you have a specific question about your x-ray or someone's x-ray, you can ask me. I'll try to answer it for you. Otherwise, we're just kind of talking uh, vaguely about ambiguous things, nebulous things. And I'm not a nebulous kind of guy. All right, any other questions? No new questions, but Sir said thank you. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. All right, again, I apologize for the bad view. It's a little bit of oozing. Why? Um, there's so much arthritis and inflammation at this area that it's literally uh, oozing a little bit of blood from lots of surfaces where there was inflammation, and that's what we're here to fix, so. The reason why there's so much inflammation goes back to the herniated disc. And disc herniations cause pain, back pain, through inflammation. Ah, oh, wow, this is incredible, huh? This one disc is so badly damaged. If you remember earlier, and if you were watching earlier, you saw that I did what's called a discogram. And a discogram is when I test these discs to see if they're causing the patient's symptoms. And yes, indeed, they were. Hey, uh, I think we got an irrigation issue. Yeah, yeah, he felt that. I think he just said thank you, right? He said, whoa, that, that's the spot. Look at all the herniations I've taken out on this one disc, incredible. You're welcome, my friend. You can see we're just about done with this tear right here. You can see a little bit of the fat from the epidural space poking its head out. Great questions from the audience. Are there any more questions? I love answering questions. We just, just so got a new know. question from Alan on Facebook. Yeah. Do herniated discs always cause pain? Can it be herniated, oh but just God. cause radiculopathy? Uh, like I love numbness, it. weakness, etc. What a great question. Thank you so much for asking that question. That is a genius, brilliant question from our viewer. The answer is you are correct. Not all herniated discs cause back pain or leg pain. Some of them just cause weakness, numbness, tingling. And it doesn't have to be all three. It could be just weakness, numbness, or tingling. So the reason why is simple. Large herniations can pinch the nerve and cause weakness, numbness, tingling. It's the inflammation that causes back pain and leg pain like sciatica. So without inflammation, there won't be any back or leg pain. And not all herniated discs cause inflammation. We have 
lots of people with herniated discs that have zero radiculopathy and zero inflammation. So they have no back pain and no sciatica. You are correct. Yeah. That's why we don't treat all herniated discs. We only treat the ones that are causing symptoms. And to determine if someone's herniated disc is causing symptoms, that requires some testing and a physical exam and a lot of experience from the doctor. Just about done. Yeah, you're doing great. Hang in there. We're pretty much done here. Huh? All right. Let me just see if I need to do a little more right there. I'm thinking just a little bit right there. So yeah, great question. Uh, there's two conditions, radiculopathy, which is basically damage to the nerve from being, getting pinched uh, by a large herniation. And then there's uh, uh, inflammatory symptoms such as back pain and leg pain. Great question. This is a lateral herniation right here. I'm working on it. I'm just using this laser to break up the herniation in smaller pieces. Again, I apologize for the poor quality of imaging, but that's just a little bit of blood. All right. Back to the medial portion where the pain comes from. Thirty seconds here. What do you have the laser on? You. What what's what's the setting? What's the setting? Three point five and fifteen. Thanks. Is that maxed out? Luis? Yes. Seems to be working nicely. Septic, and we're going to clean this out. No, give me the irrigation. I don't put that much, Luis, anymore. Okay. I just put a few drops in there because you don't need a, a whole syringe full. So we're done with two discs. We're going to do our third one next. And Luis is going to tell me which one. Can we do middle mic? <laughs> Skin is not where the pain is. But yes, I will. I'll be happy to do that for you. Do you mind if we do the other one? Yeah. <laughs> Please. <laughs> yeah. We're not going to crush the tube. I can tell you that right now. Luis is worried we're going to crush our tube and he wants to get through because some discs are so collapsed that you can actually get a crushed tube. 
And I don't feel like this guy is going to give us a crushed tube. Exactly. What do you think about muscle relaxer before surgery? Something like that. I mean, will it affect respiration? Do muscle relaxers ever affect respiration during uh, propofol sedation? Oh, synergy? But they won't like depress the diaphragm, right? Not, not, not enough of a dose. We should try it. All right. So here we go. We're going to um, jump over to L23 shot. And I'm going to numb the skin up some more. Anesthesiologists like when we use numbing medicine. And the reason is yeah, thank you very much. that if you're going to make an incision, you're going to, you know, there's a lot of pain fibers under the skin. So if you numb them up, then uh, the patient won't feel as much. So they don't have to give as much anesthetic, which is safer for the patient. Okay, we're going to start at L23 now. And, and then we're going to finish at L5S1. There's another question from Alan on Facebook. Shot? Yeah, Alan. Alan on Facebook. Would you still Shot? do surgery if, the, uh, if there's no pain but lots of weakness and numbness? Hold on a second. Let me just focus for a second. Uh, would I still do surgery if there was... I didn't get that whole question. If there's no pain but lots of weakness and numbness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, the great question. Um, would you still do surgery if there was no back pain or leg pain, but they had um, lots of numbness and weakness? The answer is yes. Numbness and weakness usually mean there's a pinched nerve. And we would do this surgery to unpinch the nerve. That's what we're doing the surgery for. This particular patient has back pain and he has weakness and numbness in his legs. Yeah. So we're doing it for the inflammatory reasons, but also for the, uh, the radiculopathy. Lay still, you're doing great. You want me to wait? Wait? So we're gonna put him a little bit more to sleep, get him more comfortable. All right, you can see what I'm doing here is I'm gonna place this dilator that I've passed through the muscle and soft tissues. I'm gonna put it into the disc, right through the tear. And you can see it pushing the herniation right now. Yep. So he doesn't like it because we're on that area of his herniation where it's so painful. And that's what we're here to fix. I, I feel like I could almost guarantee that he's not going to have any of that pain that he had coming here. We, we see it all the time. Virtually every patient, the disc pain is gone. Now some patients, about 25%, are going to have a different kind of pain called facet pain. And let me know when I can go. The facet joints run around on the side of the spine behind the disc. And this surgery doesn't fix facet pain. It only fixes disc pain. So if somebody has just disc pain, their pain will be gone. If somebody has disc and facet, then we're going to have to do a facet treatment as well. And we about 25, eh, maybe 20% of our patients have both facet and disc. So we do the disc and then if they have facet pain afterwards, we'll have to add a rhizotomy. Shot? Take? All right, very good. Shot? So we are now inside L23 disc and we're gonna bring our tube down. And let me just show our audience. The whole surgery is done through this little, uh, it looks like a shake straw that's, um, made out of stainless surgical steel. Of course, all of this stuff is made in Germany, but it's all FDA approved. What's wrong? Everything okay? What are you, ha ha. Okay. Shot, you guys doing a little patient comforting shot? Yeah, we're almost done with the bad part. Just give me a second. All right, I'm gonna see where this tip is, shot. 
shot. That looks pretty good. I'm happy with that. I made the incision eight millimeters instead of seven. So I could have gone a little smaller. But the whole surgery is going to be done through these two little incisions, each one of them on average seven millimeters. And this is outpatient surgery for those of you watching. This patient's going to go home in about an hour after his surgery. Now, home is a relative thing. I always say home, but a lot of our patients are from out of town, out of country. So he's from out of town as well. And he'll, what? That looks like, that looks like connection between this camera and the, and the um, port. All right. Flynn, are we back on? Yes. Well, we already fished out a big herniation. Let's show it coming to the eye in the sky. Lights on, please. Can you see this? Yes, we can. So that's a pretty good size herniation. Luis, put your finger there so we could compare it. Yeah, look at that thing. So that's from L23. So what I can tell you already so far is that L23 and L34, which are definitely causing a lot of his pain, those are the more recent herniations. And that doesn't surprise me because most people herniate L5-S1 and L4, L4-5 first. And he's been dealing with that pain for many years. And more recently, I think he's herniated 2, 3, and 3, 4. All right. You guys are doing all right? This will be a pretty quick one. I don't see much more herniation in it. Just the annular tear needs to be debrided. What's wrong? You guys can lighten them up a little if you want. Oh, good. We have All a right. question from Elaine on Facebook. Yes, Elena, Elena or Elaine? Elaine. Elaine, nice to, to have you watching. I'm Dr. Duke Majin. We're doing the surgery right now. Let's hear your question. Can this procedure help with spinal stenosis, spondylolisthesis, and degenerative disc disease? Yes, great question. Can this procedure, this endoscopic surgery you're watching, help with spondylolisthesis, degenerative disc disease, and spinal stenosis? The answer is yes. Every one of these patients you're watching has, this patient has scoliosis, post-laminectomy syndrome, spondylosis, spondylolisthesis, stenosis, and I already said scoliosis, herniated disc, bulging disc, ruptured disc, annular tear, radiculopathy, neurogenic claudication, facet arthropathy. So, I mean, the truth is, is that these patients have so many of the diagnoses that you've mentioned and more, and we're able to fix their pain without treating the scoliosis, without treating the spondylolisthesis, but we are treating the stenosis. So we're um, getting rid of the stenosis that's pinching the nerves to get rid of the leg symptoms. So to answer your question, yes, this procedure can treat all of those. Does this procedure correct scoliosis? No, but you don't need your scoliosis corrected. Uh, I'm a scoliosis deformity surgeon. I correct scoliosis as part of my practice. I've done a thousand scoliosis fusions and corrections uh, over the last 26 years. And what I've learned with the laser surgery that you're watching is that we don't need to correct the scoliosis. It's not the cause of the pain. The pain is due to a tear in the back of the disc, and that's what I'm fixing right now with an endoscope. So you don't need to have a major surgery. No matter what your doctor tells you, you don't need it. If you'd like to see some of my scoliosis correcting surgeries, just go to our YouTube channel Will you put a link to our YouTube channel, Flynn? Yes, Dr. Duke. Just copy and paste one and put in uh, a link to the, to the lumbar T-lift, the fusions. I've also written papers and published papers on um, fusion surgery for degenerative scoliosis. If you look up on the uh, PubMed, National Library of Medicine, Duke Majin, 
my name and look up uh, TLIF, TLIF or lumbar fusion, you'll see that I've published and uh, I'm an expert in correcting scoliosis in adults, which is the most common scoliosis. Um, but I've stopped doing it because this surgery fixes those people's pain and they don't need that fusion anymore. Um, before we had this endoscopic surgery, that's all we had was fusions. Right, Luis, you were, yeah. you were here for how many years have you been here? Oh. Nine years? Almost eight. Almost eight, yeah. okay. So you remember the days when all we did was fusions every week. Oh, yeah. We don't do that anymore because it's not necessary. And we have better results with this surgery than open spine surgeries. So nobody wants the, the fusions. If your surgeons are recommending fusion, they're giving you a recommendation for an old technology. It's kind of like how the United States sells tanks to foreign countries, but we reserve our stealth bombers for ourselves. That's the latest, best technology. So we're happy to give away the old technology, but we keep the newest stuff for ourselves. So it's the same thing. If your surgeons are recommending fusion, they're giving you the old stuff. They just haven't kept up to date <laughs> with the newer technologies. That's something that should scare you. If I had a surgeon who wasn't doing the latest and best, I would leave and find a better, a better opportunity for getting my back fixed. So. There's really no excuse for spine surgeons not to keep up with the latest, best technology in their field. It's a disservice to their patients when they don't. So I personally will assess all technologies to see if they're of value to my patients. And if they're a new technology that's really good, like this endoscopic surgery, then I'll bring it to the practice and I'll give it to my patients because it's better than what I've been doing. So. We have another question from Elaine on Facebook. Yes. I have almost bone on bone on L45. Uh, do you think you could fix that with the Duke laser disc repair? So the question is, I have almost bone on bone at L45. Can you fix that with Duke laser disc repair? So the answer is yes, I can fix your pain, but I can't put a disc back in there so it's not bone on bone. So when I'm done fixing your pain, your pain will be gone, but your bone on bone will still be there. So why, why do I say that? Because Bone on bone is not the cause of your pain. Uh, again, that's a fallacy, it's a, a mistruth. It's not true that bone on bone is the cause of pain. Now, I used to tell my patients the same thing back when I left my training, because that's what I was told by my teachers. Some of my teachers said, it's the bone on bone that's the problem. But what I've learned over the years is it's not the bone on bone. I can actually cure pain without fixing bone on bone. Like take this patient, for example right here, this particular patient. He has bone on bone at every disc. And we're gonna get rid of his back pain that he's suffered with for years with this surgery, even though I'm not putting a spacer or anything in. Again, it's a, mis it's a, it's a falsehood, it's not true. Everything okay? Just about done here, guys. And then we got the 5-1 and we'll be done. Just about done, about another 30 seconds. I'm looking lateral here. By the way, that pink thing is the end plate. That's the, the bone, the vertebral body end plate. That's what abuts the disc. All right, grab her. You guys doing all right? Patients okay? All right, so again, just everything is pretty much, you can see it's bone on bone here. So whoever asked that question, I want you to look at this disc, okay? There's bone, ah, all this junk. Sorry, let me get rid of this stuff. It's supposed to wash out. There's bone right there. I'm touching that pink thing there is bone. And then there's bone right there. And there's really nothing between them. The disc is gone. And you know, my goal here is not to give him a disc. My goal is to get rid of his pain. Just about done, you're doing great. And the way we do that is by treating the annular tear. Right here. Lay still. 
We're almost done. You're doing fantastic. You're doing great, just about done. Hang in there, my friend. All right. That's it. That's it. All right, you're doing fantastic. He's just not happy right now. All right, give me the grabber. I'm going to get that last piece of herniation out. We're done. You can see... Uh, the tear is already coming back together now that I've gotten the herniation out. Take scope off. All right, great questions from the audience. So once again, you don't need to get rid of scoliosis. You don't need to get rid of bone on bone. Neither of them will get rid of your pain. The pain comes from a small tear in the back of the disc. I've been preaching this for 16 years now since I discovered it. Unfortunately, uh, most people still don't understand that. Let's go ahead and run our video again, Lynn, the one that shows the causes of how a herniated disc causes back pain, irrigation. Traumatic injury to the disc can cause annular tears to form. Pressure on the disc causes herniation of the nucleus pulpus through the annular tear. Inflammatory tissues develop within the annular tear causing back pain. The inflamed annular tear generates pain signals. Additional injuries can cause symptoms to worsen. Inflammation from the annular tear can spread to nearby nerve roots causing leg pain. Signals travel up nerves to the brain, causing localized back pain. Pain signals reach the primary somatosensory cortex, causing conscious awareness of pain. If you have a herniated or bulging disc and back pain, submit your MRI for a free review at www.mri.dukespine.com. And do we have any more questions from our audience? Yes, we have a question from Jay Whiteside on YouTube. Is this done under sedation or general anesthetic? Hi, Jason. Great question. So this lumbar or lower back procedure and thoracic disc procedure are done under propofol sedation, not general anesthesia. We do the cervical laser surgery under general anesthesia. So this is sedation. And we have our anesthesiologist and our nurse who are closely monitoring the patient to make sure that he's safe, he's breathing, uh, and he's comfortable. And there are gonna be times when he's not comfortable. Shot? Shot? All right, I'm just making sure my guide wire's there. And so if, he, if he's more uncomfortable, we're gonna give him a little more of the sedation. And if he's comfortable we're going to keep them there it's uh it's like juggling for the anesthesiologist you know they want to keep the patient comfortable by making them sleepy enough but they don't want the patient to stop breathing or aspirate so it's a balancing act and it takes a really good anesthesiologist to do it right let me have it shot all right so now we're down here at the level of the facet joints and i'm i need to get past them and get into the 5 1 disc. Meanwhile, I'm staying in constant communication with my nurse and my anesthesiologist, and they're letting me know how this patient is doing. If at any time we feel it's not safe, we're going to stop and we're going to uh, we're going to we're going to have to abort that disc. Shot. All right. 
Well, I feel we're in the disk space, so we're getting the guide wire out, a little bent. And let's see what we got. So he's moving a little bit. All right. Next, I'm going to bring my tube down for the last time. And this is endoscopic spine surgery. For those of you who joined us late, this is a minimally invasive procedure. Just lay still. You're doing great. Instead of doing open surgery, this patient didn't want a fusion or open surgery, so he chose to do endoscopic surgery. Shot, you're doing great, just lay still. Almost done. Is he, is he uncomfortable with his neck position or what? Okay, so just laying here. Yeah. No problem. Um, so we got a little bit of tissue caught here. We've cold welded the dilator and the tube. Now I've got to separate them. That should do it, Chuck. All right, I'm going to advance both one more time, and then we'll get the dilator out. Shot. Perfect. Go ahead. Yeah. Great questions, by the way, from the audience. Completely? Yep. Right. Shot. Let's move the fluoro out. Last disc. Now remember, this patient's actually going to be back on Thursday, two days from now, for his uh, right side. Now, normally we don't need to do both sides uh, for back pain, but we need to do both sides for leg pain. So this patient has equal neurogenic claudication on both sides. So this surgery today will fix his left leg symptoms and his back pain, but it won't fix his right leg symptoms. So he wants, he wants both legs treated. That's why he's staying here for the whole week and getting it done. All right. We did a discogram here, right? We did it, yes, yes sir. All right. There's not going to be much to do here. I can already tell you that. I need uh, five minutes. Five minutes, Doc. This disc is, this is the most collapsed of all. There's a piece of herniation right there. Let's get the laser. Oh, hold on. Uh, let me find the corner. So what you're seeing there is a little bit of degenerated disc left in the disc space, and that's attached to the end plate of S1. And this is all inflamed. Look at how, how pink it is, red it is. Some of it's blood clot, but um, a lot of it is inflammatory tissue from the inflammation. Okay, I need about two minutes. Doctor, I'm already on the annular tear with the laser. You guys can see at 12 o'clock the blue laser fiber. And I got to clean up this tear and we'll be done. There it is. It's like a little beast that just hangs like a little COVID bat, right? When I think of the COVID bat, I think of this creature just hanging by its feet upside down. Now, normally I like bats because they're cute, but this is like, this is not a cute bat. This is a bad bat. It's like a huh? It's like a, like a, a what, a what? We're getting a bad story here, folks. Sorry. So, 
our nurse here, Crystal, is telling us about a bat that got into her house in Wisconsin and how her German Shepherd or Doberman? Yeah, German Shepherd. Her German Shepherd, you know, jumped on top of her to protect her. To get between you and the fruit bat. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Don't eat our strawberries. You're great. Yeah, we're almost done. About five more minutes, sir. Can you stay still for five minutes, Carmen? Can you do it? Thanks. All right, no moving unless Simon says. <laughs> All right, so this is it. I mean, there's. You can. People ask about degenerative discs. Uh, this is a degenerative disc. There's just not much left. And it's not the bone on bone that causes pain because if it was, all these people would have pain. Okay? So none of them have pain from their, from their discs. I need uh, two minutes and I'll be done. Just want to finish this last bit of um, annular debridement right here. Yeah. Oh, you're doing great. You're going to be so happy when this is all done. Yeah, I know. It's calcified, by the way, in case you're wondering. Ten seconds. Yeah, you're doing great. Just lay still. All righty, we're done. We're done. You did it. Scope off. We'll do a little antiseptic. The antiseptic we use is iodine based, so we always want to make sure that our patient. Uh, don't have an iodine allergy. Iodine is a wonderful antiseptic. Needle is down on the field. Watch it. We're done. You did it. Thursday. <laughs> More fun Thursday, huh? We're going to have to desensitize him to the anesthesia mask before Thursday. Just give him a mask, let him take it home and put it on and just get used to it, right? Okay, great. Surgery went really well. Um, you know, from a, accent, from a difficulty standpoint, for me, this was a, probably a 9 out of 10. And I know from an anesthesia standpoint, it was a 9 out of 10, doctor. 10 out of 10. This is hard as it gets. So, you know, it just shows you our level of commitment and quality that you get at Duke Spine Institute. The hardest anesthetic cases, ones that would make other doctors run for the hills, we do. Um, because we, we have the best equipment, the best staff, and the best training. So we can give our patients the best quality of care. Hey, lay still. We're almost done. All right, we're going to put two stitches. But you can see the incisions, guys. Very small. You did great. I just want you to know if we had done a fusion surgery, the, uh, the incision would have been this long. Can you guys see this, Flint? Lay still. Yes, we can, doctor. All right. I gave him some local, so he should be good. Let's get that clean, close up. All right, Flint, why don't you... Show them the difference once more between a fusion and the Duke laser disc repair. Um, and I'll be right there to answer questions. So have them type up, type up your questions and I'll come and answer them for you. Thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed the surgery. Duke laser disc repair. A comparison with traditional spinal fusion surgery. A patient with chronic back or neck pain originating from a symptomatic disc injury could undergo either traditional spinal fusion or less invasive Duke laser disc repair. 
This MRI represents a typical case with L45 and L5S1 symptomatic discs. A symptomatic disc causing neck or back pain can include bulging discs, herniated discs, ruptured discs, degenerative discs, protruding discs, spinal stenosis, radiculopathy, and sciatica. This patient can choose traditional fusion surgery or the Duke laser disc repair to help alleviate the pain caused by and within the symptomatic discs. Here, two patients with comparable disc injuries are treated. On the left, the highly invasive spinal fusion, and on the right, the least invasive Duke laser disc repair. The spinal fusion requires a very large incision, usually leaving a large scar. The Duke laser disc repair requires only a very small incision, usually less than a half an inch long. In this small opening, a cylindrical rod, called a dilator, is inserted to gently spread the muscle to create a small passage and guide through which the surgery is performed endoscopically. The incision for the fusion continues, including penetrating the skin, fat tissue, and multiple layers of muscle through to the bone. With the Duke laser disc repair, a mallet is used to advance the tip of the dilator into the symptomatic disc. A tube, called the tubular retractor, slides over the dilator and is carefully positioned into the disc, again using the mallet. The rest of the entire Duke laser disc repair surgery will occur inside this narrow tube. To access the spine, the spinal fusion requires the muscle to be separated from the vertebrae. This very invasive action causes trauma and permanent damage to the muscles. Whereas in the endoscopic Duke laser disc repair, the muscle is not damaged. The endoscope camera is inserted into the tubular retractor to allow the surgeon to guide the laser inside each symptomatic disc. To accommodate the fusion hardware, a large bone grabber is used to perform a laminectomy by removing bone from the spine. The fiber optic laser used in the Duke laser disc repair is manipulated with great accuracy to remove only painful inflammatory tissue from the disc. In this highly magnified view, the laser is used to precisely remove damaged disc material that is causing the pain. The laser is debreeding, or essentially vaporizing, damaged tissue in the disc's outer layer, or annulus, specifically at the annular tear, the source of the rupture or herniation and pain. After the fusion patient's damaged discs are removed, a metal or plastic cage housing bone grafting material is inserted in place of the removed discs. Once the laser has removed the painful part of the annular tear, the endoscope and tubular retractor are removed, leaving less than one half inch incision in the skin, which is closed with a single stitch, strips, and a band-aid. Total time for the Duke laser disc repair surgery, approximately one hour. The fusion, however, is still underway. Holes in the spine must be tapped in preparation for the large pedicle screws that anchor the fusion hardware. The Duke laser disc repair patient is in recovery usually 45 to 60 minutes before release to go home. The fusion screws are inserted into the bone, as shown in the x-ray. After all screws are in place, rods are used to connect the screws together to prevent movement of the secured vertebrae. Cross links are added to bridge the rods together for additional stability. Fusion hardware, by design, is to fuse joints that normally move, preventing natural movement in the damaged portion of the spine. Whereas with the Duke laser disc repair, there is no loss of movement. Normal movement and flexibility of the disc and joints is preserved. The Duke laser disc repair patient is soon back home, enjoying life, with a very fast recovery, allowing normal activities without pain. Meanwhile, bone graft material is placed throughout the fusion surgery site. These morselized pieces of bone will eventually grow together to help promote the fusion process. Prior to closing the wound, a temporary drain is installed to allow excess fluid to drain. Average surgery time of a traditional two-level fusion is two and a half hours, with an additional three to four hours in the recovery room. As we've seen in comparison, a spinal fusion requires a much larger incision and results in a significant amount of scar tissue. The Duke laser disc repair's half-inch incision leaves no scar tissue around the spine or nerves. A large amount of bone is removed with a spinal fusion. With the Duke laser disc repair, no bone is removed. Each disc is accessed through a natural opening in the spine. The entire disc is completely removed in a spinal fusion, even though only 5% may be damaged. The Duke laser disc repair leaves the normal parts of the disc in place and removes only the painful annular tear on the damaged disc. 
Fusion requires hardware, including screws, rods, plates, etc. The Duke laser disc repair does not require any hardware. The patient is totally hardware free. Fusion surgery is very invasive. Cutting and moving the muscle structures and tissues for a spinal fusion causes trauma resulting in permanent damage to the muscles. Whereas with the Duke laser disc repair, there is no damage to the muscles. The Duke laser disc repair is the least invasive surgery available to repair a damaged disc. With spinal fusions, patients are required to take highly addictive narcotic painkillers, which can cause constipation, bowel, and bladder complications. Due to the minimal pain, narcotics are not needed with the Duke laser disc repair. Spinal fusions have a high risk for infection. The Duke laser disc repair has a very low risk for infection. In the seven years the Duke laser disc repair has been performed, there have been no infections. Spinal fusion surgery has a very long recovery and requires a great deal of physical therapy and time to heal from the trauma in the muscles and the spine itself. Whereas the recovery from Duke laser disc repair is in a matter of hours or days, rather than weeks or months. With fusion, the spine is being fused together, losing movement. Whereas there is no fusion with the Duke laser disc repair, normal movements of the joint in the spine is preserved. Spinal fusion results in loss of mobility. There is no mobility loss with the Duke laser disc repair. In fact, most Duke laser disc repair patients experience improved mobility after the surgery. The Duke laser disc repair is FDA approved. All the instruments and equipment used are FDA approved. This proprietary surgery itself has been peer reviewed and published and is performed exclusively at the Duke Spine Institute. With the highest published success rate of 95%, the Duke laser disc repair is proven to be the most successful and least damaging spine. I'll take that as a no. All right. Well, uh, please bear with us as we experience technical difficulties. We have gone through uh, videographers like you go through toilet paper at home and uh, now we have um, some of my staff stepping in and, and doing the best they can so we apologize for any interruption. But um, I'm Dr. Duke Majin and you've just watched a four-level Duke laser disc repair left approach. So our patient has had back pain coming from his discs in his back. And just so you understand, the lower back has the lumbar spine, which is made up of five vertebrae and the tailbone. The tailbone is called the sacrum. And so the lumbar spine really starts right above the tailbone with the first disc above the tailbone called the L5S1 disc. Above that is L5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Those are bones. The bones aren't the problem, folks. The problem is the disc or cushion between the bones. That's what I repaired today was the disc. Didn't do anything with the bones. Didn't do anything with the bone on bone that this patient has at four levels. Uh, didn't do anything with his scoliosis and didn't do anything with his post laminectomy syndrome. I didn't do anything with his facet joints. All I did was I went inside the disc and I basically cleaned out the tear in the back of the disc. It's called an annular debridement and it is part of what's called the Duke laser disc repair because that procedure, the annular debridement, was pioneered here at Duke Spine Institute by me 16 years ago. And the purpose of the procedure is to get rid of back pain. If we do it in the neck, it gets rid of neck pain. We also do it in the thoracic spine now. So this patient had four disc herniations with annular tears on the left side. And we went in on each one and we cleaned up the tears and the herniations and unpinched the nerves. So I expect his left leg pain to be gone, and I expect his left leg neurogenic claudication to be gone. That's where you stand up and walk and you start getting an aching pain in your leg. You may get weakness, numbness in the leg as well. All of that's due to the nerves being pinched as they exit the neuroforamen. Um, I also expect his back pain to be gone from L2 to S1. And surgery actually went really well. It went better than I expected because He's a tough one to get into in terms of accessing those areas properly, and uh, it went pretty smooth. So we did a discogram as well, and during the discogram, we were testing to see how much pain each of those discs is actually causing. 
And this disc at the bottom was a 10 out of 10 pain. This was a 10 out of 10 pain. This was a 10 out of 10 pain. And this was a 10 out of 10 pain. So we basically had four discs that were 10 out of 10 pain. And those are the four we fixed. So I expect that pain to be gone now that we've done the Duke laser disc repair. All right, we'll take our first question. How long will it, uh, the Duke laser disc repair last? Can it herniate again? So the first question is from Jennifer on Facebook. Jennifer on Facebook. Thank you, Jennifer. How long will the Duke laser disc repair last? It's permanent. It lasts the rest of your life unless you re-injure the disc. And patients do re-injure the disc. About one in a hundred patients will do something they're not supposed to do. Usually they're bending over, trying to pick something up, uh, whether it's a sack or a dog or a suitcase. I've heard it all and they end up feeling a pop and they've re-herniated. So um, they can also do it in their neck and re-herniate. The chance of re-herniating is 1%. That means one in 100 patients. So I've done 1,400 Duke laser disc repairs in the last 16 years. And in those 1,400 Duke laser disc repairs, I have seen one out of 100 re-herniate. So we've had about 14 re-herniations, going on 15. Um, so that's the average re-herniation rate, one in 100. Next question. We have another question from Elaine on Facebook. Would my back cause my knee to go bone on bone? Hi, Elaine. You asked the question, would your back cause your knee to go bone on bone? The answer is typically no. A knee problem is gonna be independent of the back. Now, when you have bone on bone and you got pain in your knee, whether it's from a tear in the meniscus or instability, it can actually cause your back to hurt because you're not walking right. Um, can your back pain cause you to walk funny and have a knee problem? Yes. If you have a bad back and it's hurting you to walk straight and you start to favor one side, then yeah, you can put uh, pressure on that knee and over years and years of time, it can cause that knee joint to wear down. So back problems change the way you walk and stand and fit, cause you to favor one side, which then can cause the knee and hip and ankle and foot on that side to wear down and have arthritis. Um, on the other hand, if you have a hip problem or a knee problem or a foot problem, on one side, you can actually get back pain just from walking funny. That was our last question. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back in about 30 minutes with our, uh, sorry, never mind. Our second surgery will be in an operating room number two, which we don't have the ability to video. So we're going to be back in about two and a half hours for surgery number three.